Now that we've seen how important moment of inertia is, let's do some practice calculating it. We're going to start with a discrete calculation, meaning that we have individual point masses that we can think about. And this is a picture from a book, but from a different problem, where we've defined the axis of rotation to be through this mass, but we have two other masses. So the question is, what is the moment of inertia of this object when it's rotating through this mass? Now we have this equation that the moment of inertia is going to be the sum of each mass times the radius squared, where this, the radius is the distance from the axis of rotation. Now something that's important to note, for this situation, we're going to model each of these blocks as a point mass itself. So we don't care about the size or shape of the individual blocks. So that is an approximation, a simplification. I have three blocks, so I should have three terms, and in each case it's going to be the mass of the block, and then the second term will be the distance it is from the axis squared. My first term is this 300 gram block. Note that the distance here is zero. Why? The axis passes through the block. I would encourage you to actually write it down when you have situations like this. Yes, this term is going to be zero, but you want to make sure that you've accounted for every mass. If you don't write that down, perhaps you've made, uh, perhaps you're just going to start forgetting terms. So please write down every mass. The second one is this 250 block, and the distance it is from the axis is 8 centimeters. So 0 0.08 meters squared. Lastly, you have 150 grams, which is 6 centimeters from the axis. This distance doesn't matter at all, so all we care for each piece of mass is how far it is from the axis. Note that a second approximation that we've made is that each of these bars themselves are effectively massless, so we don't have to worry about the bars themselves, or else this calculation, while still doable, would be a little more challenging. We then plug in numbers and we get some value. There aren't special units for moment of inertia. Note that it's kilograms times mass squared, those are the right units, and it's hard to have much of a feeling for it, right? Like, I I don't know, is this a big one? Is this a little one? In this case, it's pretty little, right? These are grams. This isn't hard to turn. But where this will come in is later on, if you're doing a calculation to understand about torque or uh, energy, rotational energy, or to compare different objects, you can figure out which moment of inertia is bigger. What if instead of having uh, discrete masses, you have a continuous object, which is normally going to be the case? Well, a few steps. First, always make sure you know what your axis is. Make sure that it's clearly defined in terms of your representation. Now, one option is that you initially use the center of mass and you do a shift later via the parallel axis theorem. So make sure you know what axis you're doing the rotation around. Center of mass is a choice if you have a choice to make, or you can actually simplify the math by using the center of mass. So Make sure, though, that you're at least clear for yourself and who's ever looking at your work which axis you've used. Next, what you're going to be doing is breaking your mass into differential pieces and then integrating over the distance squared. So R, R in this case is your distance from that individual mass to the axis. Now, in actually doing this integration, you're either going to want to work in polar or xy coordinates. This choice is yours, but there's always going to be an easier choice to be made. And my hope is that you've worked through problems like this in calculus before, maybe not within this context, but the same idea. So whenever you're trying to do an area over, sorry, an integral over an area, there are smarter choices to be made in how that that's going to be more possible. We're going to go through two examples. This first example is a situation where you want to use xy, and this is for a rod. The pivot point is at the end. So we know that it's L long and has total mass M and is of uniform density. So we go back to what we did before, that even though dm is in the equation, we need to integrate over position, not mass. But I say for one given part of my rod, dm is proportionally a part of mass the way that the width of that is proportionally part of length. Hence dm is m over L times dx. We've seen this before. So I get to plug that in for dm. Now, I also define the bounds of my integration. Note that I am going from 0 to L, but this is a little bit tricky. This isn't just whatever you want your coordinate system to be. This needs to be the distance you are from your pivot point squared. 
So in this case, the pivot point has been put at zero. That is definitely what you want to do. Put your pivot point at zero. Mathematically, you can put it other places, but it's likely to be really confusing and the math is going to be much harder. So put your zero at the pivot point, and in that case, we are then integrating from zero to L. So once again, m over L is a constant. We can bring that out front. You know what the integral of x squared is. It's x cubed over 3 from bounds of 0 to L. That becomes L cubed. Divide by L becomes L squared, and we have a 1 third. So this is how you would calculate the moment of inertia from a rod that is rotating around the point on its end. So again, be careful in that the pivot point, your axis of rotation, must be specified for doing these calculations. Note that in this case, it was not the center of mass, and that's okay if this was the question you wanted to answer. So now let's look at a different one. And this is a case where we want to do this in radial coordinates. This is a little bit trickier in that it's a wheel. The rod was inherently one-dimensional. This, uh, this disc, this flat cylinder, is inherently two-dimensional. So let's look at one ring. Again, I hope that this is familiar from calculus. So we're looking at one little ring, and I say that I'm going to have some mass of that ring over the total mass. And that's going to represent the area of that ring over the total area. But I don't actually want to integrate over area. Note that I have an r here, right? For In this case, this dm was representing this ring because every point on this ring has the same radius. So I want to integrate over radius, not area. What we need to do is then convert da and a to be in terms of radii. So now a is your total area, which is your total radius squared times pi, but your dA, your differential area, is going to be your dr, your thickness of this ring, times your circumference of that ring, which depends on the radius you're at. Again, there's no physics here. This is really just um, should be a review from, from Calc 2. But now we have what dm equals in terms of radii, so we can come and plug that in up here. So I no longer have dm and need to integrate over an area. Now I have everything in terms of r, and I can integrate from 0 to r. Note that we don't need to do a two-dimensional integral in here. In calculus, you maybe learn to do the integral from 0 to 2 pi as well in theta. We don't need to do that. It is OK to start by just the step of saying, hey, there's a ring symmetric. I can just use this ring geometry. Note that important part of the setup was again saying that every piece of mass I was considering as my dm had the same distance from my axis, which is again at the origin of my coordinate system. So now let's simplify a little bit. I see a pi and a pi. I see some constants I can pull out front. And I have an r cubed. I have my original r squared, and then I have my r that came from my differential. So now, when I integrate r cubed, I get r to the fourth over 4, and I'm going to be looking at the bounds of 0 to r. So when I put in r, r to the fourth, I have an r squared on the bottom already. That becomes r squared. I have a 2 on top, a 4 on the bottom. That becomes 1 half. So again, note your units here, that the moment of inertia is always going to be a coefficient, maybe 1, times mass times a length squared. So again, if you make a mistake in the math and you get like length cubed here or length to the fourth, you've definitely made a mistake. Your units don't work. So again, that's how you actually go through the calculus here.